lose track of where we're at. So I raised the board to do a new slate because we're on New Testament now for us. The focus is going to be the remainder of a couple of lessons. And so the, the first thing we want to think about, yes, babe? The mic is on. Okay. So what you want to hear about here in the, in the scripture is that the first thing is that that prayer was initiated by God. Uh, in Genesis 20, we talked about that. And God initiated that to tell Abram, Abraham to pray for Abimelech for a sin that he committed to make sure it didn't compound itself into uglier consequences. So that was kind of interesting. But the other piece of it is it's, it's more uh, interesting. Yes? Would you ask them how it sounds now? You sound good now, by the way? Or how's it sound? Tracy said, okay, yes, now. Okay. All right. So with with regards to where we are now uh, with, with prayer, we're looking at, uh, again, these origins, how God initiated it. We look at the words in which were used. And one of the distinctive differences we saw in the Old Testament, um, a couple of things I want to highlight we talked about is that remember, the distinction is, is that you can call upon God, you can speak unto God, you can invoke his name. And, and that's like having a conversation or speaking, like you're driving in the car. You could be talking to God. Uh, you could be um, throughout your day, as Paul would say in the New Testament, as we're going to get there. Um, first list, I think it's 517, and pray without ceasing. Okay, you can constantly have a, 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 a sense of prayer. So Paul takes that calling and out to God in the Old Testament. He, he says, hey, pray without ceasing. In other words, always have short intervals. Um, some people would call it one minute vacation. Someone used to say to me a uh, long ago, they'd say, hey, when things get tough or too, uh, you know, hindering to your, your, your walk of faith, and your emotion, your state of mind, take a time out and just take a minute. Literally, they, they say that in athletics. They give me a minute. You just take a minute. You literally take a minute. And you, you just have a quick prayer to God to encourage you, uplift you, and reset your mind. And reset your mindset and everything about that, your heart, your spirit get more allocated toward what you know to be true and not let the emotion and circumstance overwhelm you. Easier said than done, uh, but it's something that um, you know we're supposed to be doing. Paul mentioned pray without ceasing, meaning don't have interrupted intervals. Uh, have constant intervals of always having yourself be in that season throughout your day of speaking with God. So, but, but there's a difference between praying to God throughout the, throughout the day and calling out to Him. It's more of an informal sense of talking to Him have a conversation, but there's this formal sense of prayer that we see, which is to intercede for and beseech God, and we saw that supplication in the Old Testament is like a petition for mercy, and so the different uh, demarcation is like like you're speaking to the, the authority of God himself, uh, you know, you can speak to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all you want, that's fine, but when you have a formal petition of, of prayer, you pray to God the Father, that's who you pray to in Jesus' name, and so that's, that's the formal petition, just like you would not formally ask ask the police or the chief commissioner or the mayor for exoneration. You're asking the judge. The judge is the one who has that power to exonerate you from the charges. And so you only go to the one who has the power to do that. And so the formal petition and the subjection to authority is where our, our formal prayer is to God the Father in Jesus' name, as he said to do. We're going to look at that today. But again, we want to look at it in the sense of also we saw in the Old Testament was it was started off as, again, the difference between calling and, and as you speak out to God and talk with him versus the formal prayer. Then we saw God initiated prayer. And then we saw that it began, it began as intercessory for the most part. And we saw that with the Israelites, with Moses, with Samuel. Then you get to David and Solomon, and we saw that it was more of a sense of gratitude and, and for uh, worship and dedication. David and Solomon, respectfully, they changed the whole reality of how that was done. And people just would normally pray to ask God for something, and they were started with David saying gratefulness to God, that they were just happy to be his child, his servant, and be used by him and be blessed by him. It was a different mindset, a different shift. Focus was off of themselves and on, on to God, saying, you know, wow, we, we just to be related, to, to know that he spent, I mean, this is, I mean, not just in my initial head among all the different peoples of this world, but that's favored by God. I've, I've been shown favor by him, uniquely different. And so Solomon went a step further and took up gratitude into dedication and worship, building the temple. And it's a powerful thing. And that's where, again, the verse is often misquoted about if my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven, I will heal their land and all. So that's a verse that is referencing Solomon's dedication and worship, which to use that to any, anybody else is really, it's really, I don't know, it's offensive to me if I'm Solomon and I'm, I'm alive today. I'm saying, don't, don't do that. It's not what I intended it for, for any country in the planet, just to start using that. That's not, you know, doggone well. 
I did not mean it that way. I meant it toward the people of Israel, toward God himself, and that particular time about the temple and what it represented to the people. And so that's what we saw that. Then we saw also a little takeaway. We saw that uh, in, in Jabez's case, I didn't, we didn't look at it, but I, I referenced it because it feels like a big deal of it. And it got to be big in the prosperity people's gospel about how he, oh, enlarge my land and bless me with this. And so they go, oh, you know, that just goes to show you that, that you know, you could do this prayer of Jabez. And all this merchandise was made of it. And books were sold. And all about a couple of verses that were nothing more than, than a prayer that a person prayed. And that's all you hear about this guy. And next thing you know, they act like it's, it's, it's the cat's pajamas. Oh, my gosh, this is what you got to, you know. It's not, it's not that at all. It's just... So, and they, oh, well, God granted his prayer. See, that means God's going to heal you like a genie. No, no, that's not what it means. It means God brought about. So I want to make sure you understand what I meant by that last week. And when God brought about the things that he had asked for, people misinterpret that because whether it was King James, New King James, the reversion you have, they'll say God granted his prayer or God, uh, God, um, uh, you know, I don't know say, God uh, fulfilled his prayer. Like, like it was some kind of request that God said, oh, actually, your, actually, your, that's your request, no problem. He's some kind of genie in a lad's lamp or something. That's not how it works. So understanding the word means that God brought it about. Understand it this way. So I don't know if you have this in your life, but I'm sure you have it. So point to think about it. I know that I have, we have kids and grandkids, and I know that I know what they like and don't like. It. And not everything, but a lot of things, especially when they're younger. And then, for example, Christmas time. You know, what, they, before they even ask what they're going to, you kind of hear and you, you pick up on what they might want. And so you already bought it. You already bought it. It's already been set aside to give to them at Christmas time or their birthday, right? And then they end up asking you for it after you've already known you're going to do it. You already did it, and you already have it, and it's already wrapped. And then they go, "Hey, I want to have the da 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 da. I want the Barbie. I want I want the toy. I want the I want that shirt. I want those shoes. You already got it. You already got it, but you're holding on to it for their birthday or for their Christmas, right? So did their request change what you already did? No, no. But since their birthday is coming up, Christmas, then you brought it about that now they're going to experience what they asked for, even though you already knew, you already bought it, you already wrapped it. They just asked for it after the fact. So what? So you're going to be penalized because you you know your child and you and you and you understood the person you love, whether it's a friend, a sister, a mom, a dad, a child. You understood their likes and dislikes, and you understood their wants and needs, and so you you answered their. That, that, that call to, to provide for them before time as a generous gift of love and compassion? Does that make you less of a person? No. Does that make you at their command? No. You're just showing love and compassion. But to make it sound like I'm at your whim to tell me what you want, I, I, I grant it to you, you you're, you're taking away from the whole initiative that, that is about the love and compassion of giving to somebody because of what they need. That's what God did with Jabez and, and or giving somebody what he, what he already desired to give them in his case. God was like, you desire to give, whether they want it or not. You're not going to know that. You desire to give it to them. Then they say they wanted it. So the reality is, you didn't give it to them because they wanted it. You gave it to them because that's what you desired to give to them. So Jabez's prayer is irrelevant to me. I could care less what he says. Don't give me this garbage that God just went, I'm waiting on what you want to have. Tell me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And God wait, and God goes, hey, I'll, I'll do what you said. That's insane. So I want to make sure we understand that's not how God works. That is crazy time. It's like Hezekiah's case. Again, God granted him more years of life. God already instituted that to be the case. Just like, again, uh, it, it, he was going to play ahead of time. Doesn't mean that Hezekiah knew that. He didn't. And Hezekiah didn't ask for more years. God gave it to him. We already looked about that when we had the Q&A a couple of times uh, a couple of months ago with uh, Sister Lanny's question. So we didn't mention that yet, but I'm going to throw that in there as well. That these are misunderstandings of how prayer is used. That they think prayer can like move the hand of God to, to do whatever you wish. That's not how that works. And, and then we'll get to today's situation on that when it comes to Elijah, you know, what time provided. How he prayed, and heaven opened up, it says, and then he you know, did stop the rain, then opened again, and started the rain. It does mention that in James, referencing the Old Testament. So we'll look at that as well. But first thing I want to get into is just the review of things and remind us the difference between, again, a God initiated prayer, the difference between calling out to God, talking to God versus a formal prayer, and then a lot of the things, how they all kind of played out. And that book of Psalms. Um, before we get to Psalms, there's this inter interlude that God took us through, because I wanted to take us through with Jeremiah, where I thought it was powerful, uh, not to forget Jeremiah 7, 11, and 14, respectfully. God made it very clear that if you're an apostate, a hypocrite, you're double and triple down on your sinful lifestyle, he has no time for you. You're gonna, you're, these are his people. 
his people living this way, and he tells Jeremiah, don't, don't, don't pray to me about them. Don't, don't do that. Nope. La, 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 la. God, God takes a deaf ear, takes, it covers his eyes, covers his ears, and he says their prayers are detestable, so why are you praying to me for them? No, that ain't going to happen. Nope. 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 I don't want to hear it. So that's pretty interesting to me. It's powerfully like, wow. And when everybody acts like they can belong to God, live as they want, when they want to go to God in prayer, he, he will definitely hear from me. Uh, we're going to see in the New Testament too. That's also, there's an interesting point in First Peter about that. Uh, so as we go forward in Psalms, again, we, we reflect back. He said, at, he said, he asked the Lord, hear my prayer. He said, and he gets to the Psalms, he says, hear my prayer. Like bending God's ear to the, to we want God to bend his ear, like he's leaning into our prayer. We want God to, to please receive my request, my cries. Please hear my spiritual intent. Hear me in the mornings when I seek you, in my distress. Answer in his faithfulness and his righteousness. Meaning, there's an interesting comment there because in the Psalms we saw last week, we read a lot of them, but remember, he said, answer in your faithfulness and your righteousness. Meaning not the way that I want it to be done. And that's the reason why when somebody says, well, how do you pray in this situation for what, what I should, you, you make, make your request made make known. You, you, you get specific, sure. You, you, you ask for what you want. You know, I want to, please help me pass this grade with a 94%. Please help me to, to fix this this car, this house, help me to get, whatever, you know. You pray specifically for what you want. It doesn't mean that you're saying that's the only way, you, you put your, at the end of your prayer, you say you have to have this intent, whether you say it out loud or not, you're saying to God, but of course, unto your faithfulness and your righteousness. So you may want this to fall apart. You may want me to not have experience. I remember I, I experienced a failure of a test four times before I took it the fifth time, and it actually cost me each time 300 bucks. So that's not funny. So only was it a financial hit to me. I was supposed to pay 300 bucks. I had to pay 300 times five, 1500 bucks it cost me. It should have cost me 300. I wasted $1,200 because of my failing of those tests. That's not fun. So it frustrates me financially. Forget that part of it. The mental, emotional part of it was not cool at all because that makes you feel like you're a lesser person if you just can't get it right. That, that makes you feel bad. I've been there. So I'm just telling you that, but so I asked God specifically to ask him, so he didn't give me that. So does that mean God didn't hear me? No, it just means he answered in his faithfulness and his righteousness. He wanted me to learn how to experience failure and respond correctly. And guess what? I did. I punched a brick wall in, in the parking garage. I was so mad. A concrete wall, I should say. It's not, not pleasant. I was so upset. I was so angry about my, myself. You know, not a God, myself. Like, gosh, God. And just kept on like getting upset at myself. And I kept responding wrong. I look back at it, and I think that's part of the reasons why he had me experiencing the failures, even though I was asking for the specifics of passing this grade. So it's just interesting how what the psalmist says, answering your faithfulness and righteousness, he means I have to accept the results, whether they're what I wanted or not, what I asked for, that you were faithful in answering in a way in which I didn't ask. And your righteousness answered in a way I didn't understand. But I have to understand that whether my prayer was answered the way I wanted to or not, they're always answered. The question is, do you understand they're answered not always the way you asked? When they're answered the way you asked, by the way, that means that you asked without realizing it or whether you did or not. Did you answer? You, you asked in God's faithfulness and God's righteousness. You asked according to his faithfulness and righteousness the specifics that brought those things into effect. And that's why God answered the way you asked. It's not because you asked the specifics. It's because those specifics you asked aligned with God's faithfulness and righteousness, which is really amazing. So that's where the psalmist wakes us up. And he also says, an honest reality, which I love, he, he also it highlights, he said, answer me speedily. All of us want that when we're in prayer. And, he, and the psalmist talks about also, he mentioned how he gets, hear my words. Please take every word I'm saying into account, because that's the one thing about human beings in conversation, is you want to feel acknowledged. And so when you're not being acknowledged, you don't feel you're being heard, because they're not listening to what you're saying. And so when you say, hear my words, you're saying, please acknowledge me, please listen to me. That every word I'm saying means something to me, I hope it does to you, God. That's what, you, what the psalmist is bringing out. And on the side, I put to remind you what we already reviewed, is that in Psalm 42, 8 and Psalm 141, God's people, it says in those two psalms, should have a set time of prayer. A set aside time. It's a fact. It says that. God's people should have a set aside time. It also says that our prayer should be a treasured sacrifice unto the Lord God. That's what those two psalms bring out. Those are highlights that we talked about already to, to kind of go over the review and understand that this is important for us to, to know that we have got to have that set aside time for prayer. We have got to have 
that, that premise of understanding our prayer should be a, a treasured sacrifice. So when you think about a treasured sacrifice, and I'll be honest to myself, is that when you wake up in the morning, and, and scriptures talk about that in the Psalms, about being in the morning, when you do this, you, you, you may be groggy, you may do your morning bathroom visit, and then you do your breakfast or whatever, but you got to have your time with, with God. And I can tell you, in our current day and age, our particular distractions are social media, our particular distractions are the demands of our social structures of whatever it may be monetarily that, re that requires our attention. And we got to block all that stuff out. And it's easier said than done when you get in bad habits and you get into, uh, you know, knee jerk reactions of what you just, your behaviors, they say it's with 21 days to form a habit. And 21 days, if you're continuing 21 days to always go on Facebook, to always go on Instagram, to always go on whatever it is you're doing, TikTok, whatever it is now. If you're always going to those places every single morning, then what's happening is every single morning, it's, it's, it's becoming a behavior that now you can't break. And now you're a part of that behavior that now is taking you away from what you're supposed to be setting aside in the same addictive way. You should be addicted in a behavioral way to praying to God. It should be an addictive behavior. Addictive. That's the one addiction you do want. There's an old Carmen song, God Rest His Soul, a, a, a charismatic singer. He used to say, I'm addicted to Jesus. That's a good addiction to have. Okay? You should be addicted to prayer every morning. It should be like a, you can't, it's like a drug addict. You can't, they can't, or an alcoholic, they can't live without that. They have to have that substance, right? So we're supposed to be like that. That's what God says about prayer. So it's supposed to be our substance. It's supposed to be our addiction. It's supposed to be our, our, our need for just pulling this in every morning. We're supposed to have that need to do that. And it's supposed to be, again, something that we see as a treasured sacrifice. So those are some of the highlights we talked about from last week. Then we got into the New Testament a little bit. We're going to look at more of this today. But in the New Testament, we saw that Jesus taught us how to pray. And we talked about that. And we left off there. But we talked about some highlights to remind you. Let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 6. And in verse uh, 5, he points out some things here that, again, Jesus highlights. And when you pray, he says, you, you should not imitate the hypocrites, for they are fond of standing up in the assemblies and at the corners of the open squares to pray, so as to be observed by men. Indeed, I say to you, they have their reward. Meaning, they want to be observed by men, let them have it. Because I'm not observing that too much at all. I told you about that back in Proverbs as well in Isaiah, where I don't like hypocrites and abominations of apostates praying to me, I don't like it at all. It's disgusting to me, their prayers. They want the reward from me, they're not going to get it. What they do want to have is uh, men look at them as if they're they're godly and spiritual. Okay, fine. Then you'll have what you want. You have the worldly accolades of men, but with me, you have nothing. And so Jesus is making it really clear. You better have introspection, and you better be humble in your prayer. That's what he's telling you in verse 5. He's giving you heads up of how to pray. He's about to tell you how to pray in verse 9. But he's telling you the, the parameters from which how we should pray with introspection, with humility. So that means you should not go to prayer with your mindset on somebody else. Oh, I can't wait to pray to God because that, that son of a, that, that, that piece of, hey, whoa, whoa. No, 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 come on, no. It's about you. It's about you going, I'm a sinner. I'm undone. I'm depraved. I don't deserve even the breath of my lungs. And I'm coming before God with this sense of attitude of, of that. Not accusing somebody or upset with somebody or angry about a situation. That's not good. You don't do that. Right? So that's why he says introspection. Check yourself. Be humble. Then he says in verse 6, But thou, when thou wouldst pray, enter into the room, the private room. And he talks about an inner chamber. And have the door closed, which has the word left side of your margin. has that word permanently closed, which they put the word locking there. Because it means to be personal and private. So that the father of yours is invisible, uh, that that father of thine sees you in secret and, and he recompenses you. Meaning, you don't have to be seen by man when you pray. No one has to know what you pray. So it doesn't work like that. It's just you. It's just you and God. No one's got to know what you said. I don't have to tell you how I pray for you in the morning. I don't have to tell you that. But if I, if, you know, but, but it's not between me and you. It's between me and God on your behalf of interceding. But it's just one of those things. So, so it's supposed to be it's supposed to be personal and private. God says, it's supposed to be in a place in your home where the kids can't just come in and interrupt you, or your loved one can't come in and just say, "Hey, what do you want? What do you want for?" No, 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 no. It should be a closed setting, uninterrupted, no distractions. You should not have a TV going. No, you should not have, uh, you know, something else that's. You shouldn't have the laptop up with the screen showing. Anything that can distract you is an error. 
and your ways of how you should be praying in your privacy. I'm not trying to be rigid and legalistic. I'm trying to give us parameters how to understand what Jesus said. I, I didn't say that Jesus said this stuff. So be personal, be, be introspective, humble, personal, private. Then he said in verse 7, and in prayer, use not foolish repetitions, which is don't babble along. We talked before about this. When somebody goes, Father God, Father God, God, Father God, God, Father God, God, Father God, stop with their petitions. And, oh God, thank you for the birds and the trees. Thank you for the for the animals. Thank you for the doggies and the kitty cats. Say, okay, stop. He already knows. Would you stop? Just would you please get on with what you want to ask? You know, that's what he's, so he's saying, because hypocrites do that. As they think by using many words, they will be accepted. In other words, be genuine and be spontaneous. I mentioned that before. Which is why people ask me all the time. When I remember when I first was, I look at uh, doing sermons somewhat in a similar way of this. Because I have a framework of what I want to have before God. Which I want to I want to just break down before Him. And I want to just speak to Him about what's on my heart. That's my parameter of my basic you know, framework when I'm going in prayer. And whatever's on my mind at the time. And then... I don't know what I'm going to say specifically, but it just comes. But this, the, the word, the, the, the teaching is kind of similar to me. I don't like to have this structure where I say, read this here, like some kind of teleprompter in front of me. And you don't, you don't pray like that. But people do that, though. We don't. We see it on TV a lot, though. We see it all the time. They, they act like, let's pray now. And they're looking at a screen and they're reading it. Their eyes are wide open, looking ahead, and they're just reading. And you're like, that's not a prayer, man. Or they open up a piece of paper and they're, they're reading. You're not praying. You're reading out loud. That's what you're doing. That's fine. But don't call it prayer because it's not. Prayer is, it is spontaneous. It's genuine. That's what it is. So then you go into verse 8 of Matthew 6. It says, Therefore do not imitate them, for your God, for God your Father knows, in other words, He knows by a way that's seeing, observing, your necessities before you ask. You know what you need for? Yeah, He wants you to be unique. Don't be like them, He says. Be unique. Be, be unique and be different from the pagans. Those are the the precursors Jesus gives us from verses 5 through 8 of Matthew 6 before his real statement about praying to our Father, which we had sung on our wedding day. Uh, that was uh, Babe's idea. Uh, we had a lady named Marcia sing the Lord's Prayer. It was beautiful. We had a kneeling bench. I'll never forget it. It's pretty awesome. Thank God for that. That I didn't think of it. Nancy Faith thought of it. And so then we had it done, and then Marcia sang it beautifully, and we were kneeling down and praying the whole time. And we weren't praying. I remember um, just kind of having her words pray for us, and it was kind of a neat thing, you know. And matter of fact, the preacher even said, yeah, I was marrying us, who didn't want to marry us at first, and later on he said it was okay. Long story short. But he actually said it was the only time he ever did a wedding um, that someone had did that. Someone had a praying bench, and they were doing the Lord's Prayer in the middle of their sermon. And I said, oh, interesting. I, I mean, I didn't, we, didn't, we weren't doing it for show. We just did it. And, I, and it's funny because it wasn't my idea. It was Nancy's idea. So it's kind of an awesome thing. And so this always it just reminds me of that. So every time I'm hearing it or referencing it or hear about it on a song or someone, this comes in my mind. It's an image it's indelibly in my, in my mind, always. So when you go to verse 9 now of, of Matthew 6, I just thank God he kind of seared that in my conscience, always as part of my pivotal life experience here. So it's a, it's a core moment, a key, a core memory. And verse 9, Jesus tells us how to pray. He says, thus when you pray, he says, pray our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, revered or hallowed be your name. So the first thing he says is he says, pray to the Father. Pray to the Father who is the authority and the provider. He didesn't say, our daddy. Notice he didn't say it that way. Even though in the book of Galatians and later on in Romans, he mentions Abba Father, which is more daddy, which is totally fine to understand and to reference him. You can call out to him like that. You can call out to him, daddy, help me. But when you're praying formally with the subjection to authority and the way of a, a, a palel interceding, something, when you're doing those things, you're praying more formally. You're addressing him as the Father who is the one who is the authority and the provider of all life and all substance. Then he says, in heaven, our Father in heaven, recognize his predisposed position. He is outside of time. He is outside of heaven and earth. Is our Father in heaven, as in not the heavens, heaven where he lives, outside of all things. It's him. He's there. Even though it says in those heavens, in those heavens, you notice left out of your margin in the, in the Matthew, it says, our Father of us who is in toys, no less the, the heavens, the voice. So it's those heavens, meaning not just the heavens that we see in our, our space and our universe, galaxy and all this kind of, no, no, he's talking about those heavens, meaning 
the one who created all of the heavens that we see, that that Father. Again. Then he says to be revered. And the word revered means to be hallowed, to be to be holy, unique, set apart. That's the first time, that's the first part of our prayer. So we have to go into our our, our posture has to be first checked to be introspective, humble, personal, private, genuine, spontaneous, unique, not like a pagan. Then when we do pray, we have to understand our posture has to be checked first so that when we pray, we pray in a, in a manner in which addresses the, the, the uniqueness of our Father, who is the authority and the provider, of his uniqueness of being of all the heavens. He's outside of all these. He's the Father of all the heavens. He's, he's Yahweh Elohim Sabaoth. It's way above. Then we recognize that he's holy to be revered. Not just to be revered, but his name. His name. So, again, his name, Yahweh Elohim Sabaoth. He's the the creator God. He's the sovereign creator. So we have to recognize his authority, his provision, his station outside of time. He's unique and set apart, and he is, in fact, our sovereign creator. That's what he starts off with in verse 9 of Matthew 6. That's supposed to be in our mindset. But all of a sudden, we go to verse 10. Let thy kingdom come, and let thy will be done upon earth as it is in heaven. Now, one thing you're going to find out here is interesting. When you look over in Luke, he leaves out the part about thy will being done. When he says, let thy kingdom come, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Luke does not record his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. If you go to Luke chapter 11, you will see this. So go to Luke chapter 11, and you will see that he leaves this part out. He just mentions your kingdom come. And Luke leaves out three things that Matthew does not. And there's a reason for that, and we'll go over that. So in Luke chapter 11, when they ask the question in verse 1, Master would teach us, or one of them asked, teach us how to pray, even as John taught his disciples, he says to them, Jesus said, when you pray, say, O Father, reverend be thy name. Leaves out the fact in the heavens, hallowed be your name, let the kingdom come. So he leaves out heavens and earth. He's not referencing heavens and earth. He's not mentioning the will of the Father at all. He says, kingdom come, later on in the next verse, and it says, Thy kingdom come in verse 2. It says, And when he said again, O Father, revered your name, let thy kingdom come. No mention of his will being done on heaven and earth. No mention of that. You know why? Because Matthew is like speaking to the Jewish people. Matthew presents Jesus as king. That's his whole focus, is to the Jewish people to let them know he is our Messiah. He is our king. Or Luke, who's the physician of Paul, who was writing to the people, saying, I want you to know he's a man, he's a human being. He was, he was in a human form, just like us, with blood flowing through his veins. He hurt, just like us. He cried, just like us. He experienced all this corrupt world, just like we did. The difference was, he was unscathed going in, unscathed going out. He was blameless and spotless and sinless the whole way through. That's what makes him different, because he is God, but he was also a man. And Luke wants you to see him as a man of flesh and bone and blood. So Luke doesn't bring out the sovereignty of God, which is the will of being done on earth in heaven speaks to the sovereignty of God. An average person who's not a Jew has no idea what that even means. Because they are polytheistic. They live in many gods. They have no idea. He's not going to focus on a God's sovereignty. That's a unique, distinct thing to the Jewish people to understand. Because nor did they be told he's a monotheistic, monotheistic belief system for his people. He's the only God there is. But they experienced his sovereignty on in heaven and earth. Oh, yeah, they did. From what they were told and what they experienced, they don't have to wonder what that means. They know what that means. The Gentiles did not understand what that means as a whole. They're here and there, they could have referenced it, the Gentiles of Egypt and so forth, but not as a whole. Yes. And they had a unique fear of his sovereignty after the Philistines returned the ark and those men looked inside where the yeah. 50,000 were killed. Yeah, they have all kinds of memories from the plagues in Egypt to the Philistines' interaction. To, to everything, to the oh, to the series of Babylonians, everything God has done through his people, they, they know he's a sovereign God that can do whatever he wants. And I'm going to look to that verse a little later about some things about that. But, but here you have, again, in Luke, he doesn't mention the will in verse 2. It's just absent. It's not there. There's no will being done on heaven and earth at all. No mention of the Father in the heavens at all. Because he's not wanting to bring up that sovereignty issue of he's the all-knowing, all, all-encompassing of the only monotheistic one God there is. They don't understand that. So it's interesting. So, But over back into Matthew again, you go to verse 11. So after he talks about, so in verse 10 again, 
So God, he's talking about how the kingdom, by the way, verse 10, excuse me. He says, thy kingdom come, that will be done. So again, the kingdom is the millennial reign of Christ coming to earth. That's his kingdom coming to earth. Thy kingdom come. Whereas over, again, uh, it just mentions kingdom coming in, in Luke 11, which is kind of surprising because it's about a messianic reign, but it does speak to, as a whole, God reigning on this earth. And even though the Jews understand that as a mess messianic reign, it's still going to be God reigning to the Gentiles as well. Then you have this whole aspect of when he says, Thy, and he says, your will be done, and Luke does this in heaven. And again, that's the sovereignty of God, which is not in Luke. Then you go to verse 11, and he says, give us this day our necessary bread. And the left side of your margin, he has a different in the Matthew 6. He says, the bread, the arton of the sufficient, give them to us today. Which it speaks to a, it just means that the word art, art the word that there's for necessity, or it means the actual, that in the the, the, the semiron, the semiron, it means actually the, the in the moment what I need for app substance. Basically, he's talking about. So it's like if I'm praying and I'm in a, I'm in a need, we're going to find later on about the James passage. There's a desis prayer, which means by prayer of need, you say, Father, I, I I I need this, I need that. Well, what does need really mean compared to how he defines it versus how we define it? And need is a necessity. That's why he says the Father knows your necessities before you even ask. Food, water, shelter. You need those things. And how you need those is that's how we differ, how we would want to, we may want a hamburger and french fries and God goes, you don't need that. What you need is substance. You need some protein, you need some water. So how he gives you that, <laughs> that's a whole different thing. But you do need water, and you do need some proteins, right? So the reality is that when you get to this process of of going back to uh, Matthew 6 and 11, give us the necessary food. That's the same thing he says, basically, except for he phrases differently. He gives us day by day in Luke 11, 3. Day by day just speaks to more of the daily grind of it all versus over in Matthew. He's focused on in the day, in the moment of the day, give me what I need. So Luke's more general, day by day, referencing, whereas in Matthew's referencing the specific need throughout a day that you would have. He knows what it is. So it surprises us that Matthew, again, is more detailed because he's talking to a Jew who's been imparted with the oracles of God. They're supposed to be more detailed than their understanding of God and their walk with God. So why shouldn't their prayer life with God be different, right? So that's why you see these, these additional things that Luke didn't record, not that he didn't listen, it's just that he wasn't recording that to everybody to read it for the Jewish Gentile, the whole gamut of humanity to read. It wasn't just for the Jew mindset, which is Matthew's mindset. He's speaking exclusively to Jewish people when he's writing. Then you go to verse 12. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the word forgive, it means again to, to lose, to send away, release, release us. And the word for debts here is different because in Luke he says forgive us of our sins, not our debts. He says forgive us of our sins. And over in Luke he says in verse 4, forgive us of our sins, our hamushas. Our sins, where we miss the mark. Whereas over in Matthew, it doesn't say that. It says, "Forgive us of our debts, which is our ophidematas." And ophidemata is the actual obligations and their consequences, because how it's worded is not this ophilema, but the ophidematas, which is the ref referencing to the debts that we owe, and because we didn't pay them. The obligations that we have, because they didn't fulfill them, the consequences that therein lie. For example, you tell your kids, take out the garbage. And they go, I did it, Mom, and they didn't. They lied, right? As we all did at one point, because we didn't want to do it. Didn't think they would check. And all of a sudden, the parent checks, and you're like, <laughs> and you have to go do it. Well, in our house, my mom took the trash can and pulled it over your head in front of everybody. That wasn't fun gross and then so okay don't ever lie about that anymore you take it out right so you still are a human being you're still a sinner and you don't want to be you know doing things so you're lazy and rebellious so you lie and say yeah i did that's why if you're asking me why i did it that's, that's why just lazy and rebellious this is human nature so the point is though imagine if they didn't if I take trash out they didn't call me on what would happen it would fester the, the smell and the, and the consequence of me not doing my obligation makes the whole kitchen go ugh the old steak and the old leftover oil grease from the pork chops and the chicken or whatever, the old broccoli, asparagus, that smell. Come on, 
That's the consequence of me not fulfilling my obligation, right? There's a stench now. Thanks a lot. You know, now you got to smell in the kitchen. You need baking soda and Febreze for days to get rid of it. So that's what, that's what he means by when he says in Matthew, forgive us of our debts. He means the debts are obligations that we didn't do and their consequences that we are now dealing with. Understand that. That's the word he uses in, in Matthew 6 and verse 11, in verse, in verse 12, excuse me. It's not the same in Luke, Luke uh, 11, 4, where he says, forgive us of our sins, our mushas, where we miss the mark. That's for all mankind. So why is it that in Matthew he mentions the debts and their obligations and their consequences? It's because the Jewish people had a debt to God, didn't they? The Gentiles didn't have the word of God given to them. The Jewish people did. They had an obligation to fulfill the law of Moses. They have an obligation to live before God as a holy, distinct people. And if they didn't do it, they brought on consequences that continued. Sanhedrin was a consequence of what happened because of what they didn't do. So again, you have this, this forgive us of our debts in, in Matthew 6, 12, is because he's speaking to Jewish people. So, so far, Matthew adds on the, the, heavens of, the heavens and earth, the will of God to be done, which is not mentioned in Luke. He also mentions now in, in Matthew, not mentioned in Luke, that it's not just the armusias that Luke mentions sins. Matthew mentions debts, the opnophilomatas, that are obligations and the consequences of not doing them. Wow. Forgive us of those. And he says, as we have forgiven our debtors, those who owe us any obligation, because we forgive those people. So onward to verse 13, then he, then he says in verse 13, where Luke doesn't even talk about it. Whereas in, 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 Matthew's, in Matthew, thir, Matthew 6, 13, he says, And lead us not, the right side is a bad translation, says abandoned. He says, And bring us not, which is to lead us, to guide us into, to carry us into, into temptation, or we should say into, into testing or trial, but save us from the evil, the paneroi. So, okay, in Luke, it just says, forgive us of our hamushas in Luke 11, 4. For we ourselves are for, uh, also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and abandon us not to trial. That's all it says. It doesn't say about leading us not. It says abandon us not into temptation or lead us not into temptation. It doesn't say deliver us from the evil. It doesn't talk about that. It doesn't say that. It just says don't, don't lead us into trial. That, that's it. So in Matthew, he adds on to that don't just not listen to trial, but don't listen to trial and deliver us from the evil one. Because again, the trial is for any person that's brought into a trial and a test, temptation. Anybody can be brought into that. But only the Jewish people were the ones that Satan had his attention on as the Paneros to influence him into evil, nefarious things. Because again, it brings up that the reason why Matthew mentions deliver us from the evil one or the, the Paneros, the Paneros, is because they are in line at this point to be God's people who have his salvation unto heirship. And so Satan, as Paneros, goes after those in line for heirship. Are the Gentiles in line for heirship? No! So why would he say in Luke, Luke didn't record, deliver us from the Paneros one, because the Gentiles were first hearing about God for the first time, but not in Luke, in line for, or in, in position of, to be an heir. It wasn't in the initial intention. It has to come later as they grow in Christ to be an heir. And whereas a Jewish person was already given offer a proffer from Christ as their king to receive him and become heirs right away. They were already in a position to be heirs already when he showed up. Gentiles had to earn that right and, get, and, and, and grow to that state. So interesting, again, about these, th this movement, I want us to see this in reference to how Jesus prayed and how he prayed this differently, how he said to pray, excuse me, differently in Matthew 6, verses Luke 11 and 1. So again, in Luke and Matthew 6, he says three distinct things that are not in Luke. The will of the Father in heaven and earth. He says that. He also mentions about how he says, forgive us of our, our, our debtors, our debts, excuse me, our finmatas, our obligations and our consequences. And lastly, he mentions, don't deliver, save us, deliver us from the Paneros. Those are three things unique to Matthew that not mentioned in Luke. And all those three things speak to a different level of their spiritual position in Christ to understand the will of God the Father in, in heaven and earth, in his, his sovereign rule as our sovereign creator, 
Secondly, to be for, to be having us be forgiven of our debts, our afilimatas, because we're the ones who are obligated. The more you grow in Christ, the more you're obligated to again understand what you're supposed to do, your culpability. And then lastly, to deliver, deliver us from the paneros. He comes after as a paneros those who are in position to inherit. And to, you know, just to inherit when you first come to know Christ, that comes after you walk with him for a while to get to that point. So these are reasons why Matthew has those three different things. If you ever wondered, why is Matthew including things differently than when Luke did? I hope this answers that question as to why. So again, Jesus is saying all this to us about how we should pray. And then in, in lieu of that, then you have to go over to now understand, additionally to that, you have to understand now that Jesus also himself prayed and in the book of Matthew, in verse 26, uh, he, he prays at his, you know, excuse me, not 26, before I go there, I'm going to go to John 17 first. In John 17, he prays his, his, his only prayer, his personal prayer for his disciples, that's not recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they record the Gethsemane prayer. I want to go to this one first, this is before he goes to Gethsemane. So in John 17, we see a similitude of what Jesus talked about and how he said how to pray, he pretty much does this similar thing in John 17 for the disciples. Pick it up in verse 11 when he says, I am no I am no more in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Sound familiar? It's almost similar, isn't it? Very similar to what he's talking about right now in verse 11 of back of John 17. Yes. I think he said, are co-heirs included in the message of Matthew 6? Yes, yes, by default, yeah, heirs and co-heirs. Good question, thank you. So heirs of earth or of heaven, the reason why I say they're both included is because that's why he said, may your will be done on heaven and heaven as it is on earth. So since heaven and earth are in view in Matthew, therefore heirs and co-heirs would also be in view in my, in my opinion. And when I can see why that would be the case because it's, it's heirship in general. So yes, yeah, good, good question. Then you see Jesus, again, showing you, do you use the form and function like Catholics do, become legalistic? Oh, let us pray. Oh, Father, I love it. I'm, you know, come on. Stop, stop the posturing and the whole, you know, Gregorian monk chants into your, oh, you know, oh, you know. It's so, it's so annoying to me that they're taking a, 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 a spiritual thing and making it into some kind of enchantment. It, it's not supposed to be like that. And Jesus shows you by example. In John 17, in verse 11, his very personal, heartfelt prayer, He's following the outline, but he's changing how he's saying it, but saying, in essence, the same thing. He's saying in verse, verse 11 of John 17, Holy Father, keep them in your name. How is he not recognizing the first thing he said to them about how to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Is he not addressing that same thing? He sure enough is, right? And look in verse 12. He's going to go into, again, his will being done. And also, again, he's going to, he's going to in verse 12, when I was with them, I kept them in thy name, by which thou hast given me, and I guarded them. And no one was destroyed except the son of destruction that the scripture might be verified. Meaning, that's your will. That will be done. Our this is in heaven. Jesus is Jesus Yeshua, God, the Son is acknowledging the will being done. It doesn't matter what I what I think and what I feel. It wasn't about that. He was expressing verse 12 to show God the Father's will be done. So he's, why, why bring it up? He brought it up. He mentioned it to show you that was a will of the Father before time to be done in his time. Living on this earth as the Messiah. Then he, it's amazing. Then, he, of course, he goes into verse 13. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy completed in them. And then he goes and he goes into saying, verse 14, I have given thy word to them. And the word and the world hated them because they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. So, in this particular passage here, he says, "But I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, they have made their joy completed in them. Have my joy completed?" He's talking about giving them the necessity they have for completion. He wants them to have their, their daily bread, which is Him. He wants Him. To, he's the bread from heaven. He wants his, their joy to be completed in Him. So he wants them to have the necessity of what they have as the Father in him. That's what they, as the apostles should have. And he even talks about that in verse 14. I've given them your word. And he talks about the word of God, which you live on, every word of God. That's what you should live on, not by bread alone. So he's given them their daily bread. 
He's mentioning that daily bread necessity in verse 13 and 14. He's talking about that. And he's talking about the forgiveness of issues in verse, in verse uh, uh, 15 and, 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 and temptation. And he says, I entreat not that they would take them out of the world, but that that would keep them from the evil one. There's the Paneros again. He brings up the Paneros one. Out of the Paneros one, I don't want them in both. And he brings up in verse 16, they, they are not of the world as I am of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. He wants them to be holy and set apart. He wants them to be, again, not led to, to testing and temptation. Deliver them from the evils of sins. Keep them from Paneros. Basically forgive them of their debts. And he, he's talking about this in different ways. I find a very, not the same exact, but a lot of similitude of, of the same principles of thought of the Lord's Prayer that we find we call it Lord's Prayer. In the actual prayer, the Lord spoke in John 17, 11 to 17. It's pretty amazing to me when you see the alignment. There's a lot of things he addresses from verse 11 to 17, pretty much all, he addresses all the different things he said to them to pray for. He did that very thing for them. He, he did that for them in his prayer. So it's pretty amazing. Then then you go back over now, when I go back to uh, uh, verse uh, Matthew 26, and so the the Gethsemane prayer that he prays, which is, again, pretty profound as well uh, in its own right. It's just amazing. So in Gethsemane prayer, and, and a couple of highlights of John, uh, of Matthew, excuse me, Matthew 26, I'm not going to read the whole prayer, it's going to highlight what Jesus said in verse 36 of Matthew 26. So Jesus is now here, he said the John's prayer for the disciples, which is kind of mirroring kind of the principles that we talked about, the Lord's prayer. He's showing us how we should pray. In other words, don't take the posture of prayer should have we should always have and that structure how we pray should not be rigid but in the idea of, of, of hitting those principles which is what he showed by example in john 17 11 and 17. yes todd said this is tuesday night in gethsemane yes yes that's correct so tuesday night in gethsemane he's looking now into verse 36 of, of matthew 26 and jesus makes a great statement here which i find to be like, wow. He says, Then comes Jesus, Yeshua, with them, verse 36 of Matthew 26, into a place called Gethsemane, which means all the press, which is why it's, it's what has clots of blood. And when you press down all of they get a dark red color, which is kind of not a coincidence. It's really interesting about that. And he says, Disciples, remain here while I go there and pray. And the word for pray there is, is the word we see it differently used. There's a pros in front of it. And the word pros, uh, and here it says pros eskamai, it, it has this idea of exchange, I'm going to exchange towards. So I, he, points, he, he, he actually exchanges, and in verse 37, he says, and he, and he takes Peter, James, and John, and, and he's filled with sorrow and anguish. But in verse 39, it changes the word from praying to supplicating, and it, and it, should, it should just say that he's praying. But the difference is, in verse 36, he says, I'm going to go exchange toward God. I'm going to go pray, which the word pray here means that I'm going to have this exchange toward the Father. I'm going to have an exchange. So he's exchanging a petition to the Father, and obviously an exchange means you're getting something in return. So, interesting enough, when you think about prayer and the New Testament, this word Jesus uses, this, this I'll write the word later for you, it means to exchange towards, and really, it just it just hit me like, wow, like, that means that, okay, so our posture of prayer is one thing that we're supposed to have, okay, I got that. The structure of prayer he gives us in Matthew 6, okay, I got that. But now he's saying the, the result of prayer and the purpose of prayer is to have an exchange. Wow, an exchange. Okay, so I'm supposed to let my let my needs be made known. He already knows before I ask him, but okay, I'm, I'm coming the right way. I have the right structure in mind. I'm honoring him. But now what I'm asking in him, he's actually going to give me something in exchange. The question is, am I ready to receive it? Am I willing to receive it? And what am I going to do with it? See, Jesus was exchanging the, 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 the statements to have his empowerment of reminder of his fulfillment of the will he decided before time he was going to fulfill this journey to be our sacrifice. He wasn't second guessing it. He's just expressing to the reminder of, of what the God had already had talked about. In exchange, as David prayed back to God what God had said, in exchange to be invigorated and strengthened with the truth 
of reminding him of their oneness, of their, of their unity, that he was just wanting to, again, show us as an example that we need that exchange to be reminded of our purpose, of our calling, of our goal. How we are under the will of God the Father. Yes? Todd said, interesting, Jesus asks to have this cup removed, but Jesus knew it wasn't going to be removed. Right, and again, he's doing that to show the exchange of us letting how we feel come out, but yet, even though in his case he's just showing how he feels, it does, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's, saying to, he's saying to us that the feeling of having sin come on him is not something that he wants, but he's going to do it. But who wants to have, who wants to have willingly, knowingly sin to come into you that he's a sinless, he's sinless, he's God Almighty. He's going to have sin come on him. It's crazy. That's what he means by that. Right? He's just talking about, I don't, no one likes to have bad things happen to them. And I think God himself is like, oh yeah, it's great. That's not what he's saying. He's just saying, look, I, I ordained myself to take on sin. You're about to see what that looks like when he gets pummeled. If you saw the Passion movie, and again, with those infamous scene when the, when the Roman soldier went like this to turn him over, to scourge his back and his front. It was just horrifying. His flesh being ripped by, by the whipping. It's just so horrifying. And just to know that he was basically saying, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm going to do it. Doesn't mean I feel good about it. Doesn't mean it's going to make me feel great. I'm not. He's just like when God does, when God's, when God does things in our life that he says in, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we'll, we'll turn there if you want, but let me, I'll show you. Let me show you. 1 Samuel chapter 2, let me show you this. In 1 Samuel 2, let me show you this. Just because I'm going to read this to you does not mean God's a meaning in a big magnifying glass, like looking at us like ants, wanting to just, you know, see our antlers off and watch us squirm. But God just letting us know he's, in, he's largely in charge. And so when God's saying things like this in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, in verse 6 to 9, it, it's pretty, it, it's pretty like, it just makes me, just, you, just, you can't say anything. He says in verse 6 of Samuel, 1 Samuel 2, verse 6, the Lord kills and gives life. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord makes impoverished and makes rich. He humbles and he exalts on high. He lifts up the needy from the ground. He raises the beggar from a dunghill, from the seat from the people's princes, and he causes them to possess a throne of glory. He grants the petitioner his prayer, and he has blessed the years of the righteous, because a man is not mighty in strength. I mean, and the Lord will make the adversary weak. Holy is the Lord. I mean, I don't know what to say to that other than, uh, wow, you know, the, uh, okay, like, Okay, you know, but so when he's talking about this cup passing from me, he's just letting you know that as God Almighty, as sovereign God, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't take joy in bringing death unto you, as he said in 1 Samuel 2. No, he's just saying he does it. Just like in this case, he's going to take on our sin. Doesn't mean he's enjoying being pummeled by us. He's not taking it as a joyful thing. The joy set before him was fulfilled in the Father's will, right? In Hebrews chapter 12. The joy that before him was, was the Father's will. Not that he would see his own people mock him and and, 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 his own, and the Roman soldiers spit on him and punch him. It did not bring him joy. What brought him joy was, in lieu of all of that, he was doing it for the greater cause of what he had already promised to do. That's what he's talking about. The feeling, the, the journey, like Job's talking about. The past I love. The present is awesome. It, 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 it's, I mean, the future is awesome. The past I is awesome. It's the present I got a problem with, right? Well, Job was a type of Christ to come. Christ is telling you, it's one thing to have the will of the Father, and I agree, and I'm going to take on sin. It doesn't mean I'm going to go through it. I'm going to have a happy face about it. That's going to be, it's going to be an awesome time of loving games. It's not loving, it's not, just not laughing and jokes, right? It's a very serious, somber time of, of pain and anguish. And all he's saying is that uh, that that part I don't like, you know. That that's the part that I'm just my humanity. I got I got I got to say, pain hurts when you're when you're you're in a body of flesh, blood, blood and bone. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. Look how strong you are. Doesn't matter if you're God Almighty or not. Is it, is it, pain still hurts him. Scarring still hurts him. Punching and smacking him still hurts him. So he's saying that I I humbled myself to be a human, and because of that. I'm not looking forward to this part. This part is the part that I've never experienced before, expecting myself to this pain, to this abject evil of my own creation. I wish this would never, I wish it, I wish it, I wish this would pass on me, meaning I can't wait this is over, you know? He's gonna do it. He's just saying, but that's the will he agreed on. So, so you gotta think about the emotion, he's showing us by the emotion of it, how we should also suck it up and realize it's only for a passing time. 
Look at the greater good. Look at the greater good. So in our life, it's not that quickly passing. We said quickly. And I, for him, it was horrific to go through those hours of torment. But for us, we have a lifetime of, of dealing with parental abuse or, 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 or some other abuse in our life, mentally, physically, emotionally. Uh, something happened sexually. Whatever it is, we live with it, right? But God says, look at the greater good, though, that came from Look, Try to focus on the good. Focus on all that that happened to you. You're never going to get to the, the benefit of it all. You're never going to see the blessing of it all. And Jesus is showing us by example, it's okay to acknowledge that the pain's going to hurt. But please, as he did, move along. Move on. Move forward. Don't stay in that moment where you're going, oh my gosh, it's too much for me. He, he's saying that to show us it's okay to feel overwhelmed in the emotion of the pain. It's okay. Move on. So in Matthew 26, as he's, uh, again, supplicating in verse 39, his face falls on the ground. And this type of prayer, so before he's exchanging towards, he's just this idea of looking up. And now, as he did in John 17, he looked up and he's praying. But here in, in Matthew, he's saying he's going to go exchange toward, toward God, which is like an upward trajectory of prayer. But here in verse 39, his anguish is so much, he falls on his face. He falls on his face with so much anguish and vexing in his soul. And sorrow. But in verse 41, he says this. In verse 41, he says, Watch and pray that you enter not into trial. So this word for watch and pray, he says, watch and pray. This is this, again, same phrasing of praying that we should have in this posture of looking forward to an exchange. But in this context, he says, to do it, to watch, to have a very watchful sense of and praying. For what reason? So we enter not into a test. The word trial is the same one for temptation and test. So, so now you see why Paul says pray unceasingly. Because the more we pray, the more we have communion with God, the more we're continuing to let our petitions be made known to God, the more we're having those formal conversations of set times in the morning with God, we have the right posture, we have the right structure. The more we do this repeatedly, the, the, the less likely we'll have to be put into a test because we're already, we're already living in the semblance of we're, we're reducing the amount of tests God's got to give us because we're in closer proximity to always having it be known what we need to be doing and how to be corrected. Yes? Tracy said, uh, verse 41, is this related to lead not into temptation? It, it, it is. It is. Exactly right. And, and so it's the same similar thing. He says, let it not be something that you enter into uh, trial or the lead out into temptation. But he says the spirit is willing. The word willing here is the word prothimon, which means to be predisposed. It has this idea that you're predisposed and eager and passionate, meaning... I don't know about you, but let's get real. All of us, all of us who are in my hearing are typically people that have known God for a while. We've studied scripture for a while. We see deeper things in God's word. We see deeper, different things of God's nature and his character. We see God's character and nature being a lot more dynamic than what the average church and you would say. We see the word of God similarly in that same way. It's more dynamic. And because of that, there's a spirit in us that has an eagerness, desire to want to do what's right more than, than most people would. It doesn't mean that we're not sinners. So he's saying, as much as you may be eager and desire to do what's right because of how I've, re I've wired your disposition inside of you, doesn't mean your flesh is not powerful enough to overcome. Because the Spirit's willing. The Spirit is eagerness and passion. But guess what? Compared to the flesh, it's weak. The flesh is the one who's weak. The flesh is weak, meaning the Spirit is, 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 the spirit is eager and willing, but the flesh is weak, meaning the flesh is weak in the sense that it won't allow us to have our spirit dominate because our sinful man is stronger in us at times to God dominate our spirit, desires and eagerness, which is really scary. Think about this. So he's basically telling you that if we don't watch and pray, we ought to pray and watch. He said, watch. In other words, you got to you just can't you just can't have the right attitudes going into prayer and the right structure. You have to constantly watch yourself and going, is my mind drifting? Am I am I harboring hatred? Am I focused on bitterness? Am I focused? You got to you got to ask you gotta ask those questions to yourself. If you're not watching yourself then your sinful man inside will make your flesh weak. And the sinful man who's so strong will beat your flesh up, and your spirit, which is eager and desiring, do what's right, will just fall by the wayside. In their case, they fell asleep. Now, I don't know about you, but in this space, you, we've, all, we've all probably been in situations where a loved one has been in a situation where you're by their bedside. You know, remember, our, our, look, look, look how God made our animals. Kitty cats and doggies, they know when you're sick for some reason. I don't know how God does that, but they know when you're sick. 
I don't know how that is, but they know. And they always hang around you when you're sick. I don't know about you, if you've experienced that, it's the most one of God's special privileges and blessings in life. They'll hop up on the couch with you or in your chair, and they'll sit next to you when you're sick. And they'll just have a different demeanor about that. They won't leave you when you're sick. It's weird. It's, you experience it. Cats do it. Dogs do it. They, they do it. How they know, I don't know. But they have this special thing inside that they know, oh, they're off. And they just kind of go, I don't know where it is. And they even say there's some dogs that can detect cancer in human beings. Um, that's wild to me. As they have dogs that can detect drugs, they have dogs that can detect, detect cancer and people. It's crazy. So animals are unique like this. And so what God's saying to you is don't you understand that, that even though you're in this state that you are physically spent, you're supposed to have your, your spirit, your spirit's supposed to be able to dictate to you to know it's eager to want to do what's right, but it's supposed to sense in you, ooh, ooh, the flesh is weak in this area. I have to even more so be more vigilant because I know that at this point in time, my, my sinful man inside me is growing like a weed. In their case, they were weakened. They had a long night. They, 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 they walked for a little bit after a good good meal, heard a very crazy, that's a, a prophetic sermon, followed by a last supper, followed by some songs and a walk up, up, up this terrain. And it's now late at night, they're tired. I don't know how you feel after a full meal. I feel tired after a full meal. They've walked it off a little bit, but it's now about midnight, it's getting late. And they're getting tired. Their, their actual fatigue is setting in, mentally, emotionally, physically, it's setting in. It's a long couple days in a row, man. Then just that day, it's the days leading up to it. It was, a, it was a euphoric moment that they're just on a high high. And they're just, you know, now they're on this low low because there's the food sitting in, it's more somber, it's less of a crowd now. It's now dwindled down to just them 12 at the Last Supper, now 11, and they're now walking out. You know, it's getting late, like I said. And so he's saying, look, you don't recognize that you're weak. Recognize it. Understand who you are, where you're at at the time. Do not ignore the obvious signs of where your flesh is weak. If you don't, then your simple man inside of you will be strong enough to beat the tar out of your spirit, which is eager and willing to serve me. I get that. But the point is, you have to recognize where you're weak. You have to recognize where you're at because your spirit man will take advantage of your flesh weakness and, he'll, and, and, his, and his sinful strength pummel your spirit to not do what's right. And in their case, they fell asleep. They couldn't stay awake. But yet our dogs and kitty cats can, can, can stay next to us. I remember I, I remember any times I was sick, when we used to have a little cat, and I remember when they had dog visit us and so forth. They, they would be there. They, I would, they'd wake up before I'd wake up. Like, I, how you, they're looking at me. Just looking at me. Like how, like, like, how do they know that? It's like, they're awake before I'm even awake. So how come the disciples couldn't stay awake when Jesus needed them most, if, if you will? So it's just kind of an interesting thing where he, he, he mentions this. Then you go also over to Luke 22. Uh, he mentions it differently again about prayer. In Luke 22, also in, Math, and also in Mark 14, he mentions the same uh, in Gethsemane prayer as well. But in, but in Luke 22, he says again, he says it twice is the difference here in verse 40. And having arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into trial. Then in verse 46, again, he said, why do you sleep? Arise and pray that you may not enter into trial. So he's mentioning about not entering into trial, but he didn't say watch and pray as he did in Matthew. So again, Matthew has this watch and pray element to it to remind us to have a watchful guard to, again, keep us mindful, to acknowledge our shortcomings where they are. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I remember talking to many people, I have said to you and you have said to me that we recognize you know, certain things about ourselves that aren't becoming. Well, that's good, but if you don't recognize those things, that's the beginning of your flesh being weak and causing your sinful man in you to have the advantage over your spirit. Acknowledging where you're weak is a good thing because it allows your spiritual man to go good. I'm glad we're on the same page on this because the spirit man already knows that. It's you and your sinfulness that has to acknowledge that that so your flesh, who was already predisposed to be weak, can then not have to take advantage of you in times of distress. And so that's why, again, in the psalmist, he mentioned how, remember God, you know, in my distress, please hear me. Lean in, bend your ear toward me, remember? So in, the, in these verses about prayer, we see this as well as Jesus is showing them how they pray should be a one that they're exchanging toward God. How he fell on his face because he was so emotionally in anguish. And now they're supposed to actually watch and pray so that the prayer that we have toward God is to allow us to not just commune with God, not just have our petitions made, made known to God, so it, could, uh, could, so it can reduce the tests, the trial, the temptations that we are to engage in. 
Okay. So then we go over now. Let's go over to when you see um, in the book of James the passage regarding how when James talks about prayer in the book of James in chapter 5. And we studied the book of James already, so we already talked about this. But the book of James to remind us, just a couple of verses here from 15 um, down to 18. It said, and the prayer of, the, of, of faith, and the prayer of faith. So it says, the prayer of the faith. And this word for prayer is the UK. It's E-U-C-H-E. It's not the same thing as the prosakima. It's the root word of that word, but it's a different meaning because pros is not in front of it. So it doesn't have the idea of going towards God. So it's more, it's, it's used in Acts 18.18 18, uh, as a vow. So it's a promised prayer. It's more like you're saying to God a, a statement of promise, you know? So when you're doing it, so he says in verse 15 that the prayer, it should say more the, the promised vow of the faith. In other words, those walking in the spirit of Christ, that's the faith working in you. That's the fruit yield come out of you, which means you're in the spirit of Christ. And it says the prayer, which is a promised vow. So he's talking about that. He said that that person, the person, the prayer of the, per, of the faith, the prayer of the, that, the vow, the promised prayer of the person walking in the spirit of Christ, shall save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they should be forgiven him. So it's interesting how people use this to say, oh, you can lay hands on somebody, pray for somebody, and they're going to be just healed from your sins. It's where the priests get it from, and the Catholics come to penance, say your sins, and put a little, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, and all this kind of garbage. Because they get this idea that, you know, Dominus on this, say, come down Mary's, and you're good to go. That's, that's not the way it works, right? And so, but that's how they they get it from stuff like this. And no, 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 that's not how it works. So all he's saying here is, is that a promise, in other words, it's like anything else. Because of the person in the spirit of Christ walking by faith, living in the, in, in the love, their promise, the prayer, their, the UK, their prayer, the prayer of the faith. So when you're promising to God things that you're living in the spirit, when you're promising them, why wouldn't they be something that would be much more powerful than someone who just knows God and doesn't walk by faith and just is asking God to do things? Of course it's more 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 relevant, right? He's not talking about the fact that it's going to be the way it is because you control the narrative. No, no, no. He's saying that because of how you live your life, the faith, because of who what you're asking for is the UK, the promised vow. You're making a vow that that is what is the focus here. For as in verse 16, in James 5, to confess therefore your sins to each other and pray for each other. This is where the Catholic did it again, about this whole priest whole thing. So that you may be healed. That the earnest prayer, or the and the powerful energy prayer of the righteous man is, is very powerful. So again, the, the, the prevail is much means he's very strong. So it's just so the righteous person, this is their supplication, it says, or should say their prayer. So their prayer, and this it, it should say their prayer, but their prayer is not just regular prayer, it's their desis. Look at the word there in verse 16. It's the word desis, and it means that their need. So the fact that you're, so again, he's focusing in on not prayer itself, but on the person praying. In verse 15, he said it differently by saying the prayer of the faith. Speaking of the promised vow of those in the spirit of Christ living in love, showing that they're walking in faith. Of course, they're treated differently. Why shouldn't they? Oh, by the way, in verse 16, he says a righteous man, he has their need, their desis, it is, it is the word for prayer, the prayer of need. It is very strong, and it's more energetic, it's more powerful. Again, no kidding. It goes back to the Proverbs we saw before, and also in the Psalms before, if you're living in an abomination to God as an apostate, as a hypocrite, God would not want to hear it. So why wouldn't that also be true? He even says that to be true, that the righteous people are a pleasant thing to him. He loves hearing from the righteous in the Proverbs, remember? So, of course, when the righteous person, living righteous, there's benefits living by. It doesn't mean anything you ask for is going to be met. It just means that you're in a better position of strength to be heard. It's like when someone says, when you were a kid, for example. Remember when you were a kid and, 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 you, and you were asking, I had many siblings in my life, and you asked people around, uh, hey, uh, what we want to do? is you want to have, you want to go to the carnival, and I want cotton candy, but you know mom always wants to have cotton candy. She won't let us cotton candy because it'll rot our teeth, and I had that cavity last month. That doesn't look good. So, um, hey, ask dad, ask dad. Ask dad to ask mom. Well, no kidding. 
Because dad's got it, got her, got her, because why? Because they're one flesh, a husband and wife. Because the voice of dad matters more than my voice. That is more than my older sister's voice, my older brother's voice. But you ask dad, you, when he says the, the, the effect that's the more powerful, strong, the energy of a, of a righteous man's prayer is need, no kidding. So if I'm a little person and I say I want cotton candy, that's not a need. Even though I'm going to ask my dad to ask my mom, it's not a need. That's a want. Right? So what you, well, but the point is, on that illustration, you would use somebody who has a who has the ear of the person you're trying to influence, right? So what God's saying is, hey, we have his ear as the righteous people. If you live righteous and you're living in the faith, you have God's ear. And I mean that from we always saw in Scripture from the Proverbs and Psalms. I'm not saying this second, and this is a truth. Not everybody in Christ has the ear of God the Father the way that people who live righteously do. That's a fact. It's a fact. And we'll see more of this as we saw right here in James 5, 15 and 16. But again, he says their need is stronger. Their need, their prayer of need is stronger. I mean, it has more relevance to him than someone who's not living for him. Think of you. Now, let's change the story around. Let's just think. If you were the kid always living mischievously, always not getting good grades in school, you're at the carnival again, right? You're bringing home bad grades in school. You're, you're, you're not paying attention to your mom. You're making your, making your mom angry with you because you keep on sassing her and not doing your chores around the house. But your other brother or sister, you're bringing home good grades, listening to you, always doing chores around the house. And then that brother or sister says, I want cotton candy. Not a need, but don't, doesn't their voice Matter, doesn't that ring truer to the ears of mom and dad? Yeah, yeah, because they've earned a right to have a privilege, to have a non-necessity granted to them, right? So we do it as parents. Why wouldn't God do that? Think, people. God's going, duh, duh. You also understand that when you live ignorantly, you're going to be treated in like kind with not having advantages given to you. Why should I give you advantages that you didn't work for, others did, I'm going to give it to you? So you have God's ear more when you live righteously. So why is it important to live by faith? Walk by faith? Because your posture of prayer still needs to be there. And your structure of prayer from Matthew 6 needs to be there. But when you have the posture and the structure in place, understand that doesn't mean you can just check a box of legalism. You have to yourself embody the faith, living in love. And you have to make the, you have to be that, that sense of that righteous person. And when you are living by what God's righteousness says to do, you have his ear when you pray. That's a great promise to know. You have his ear. He's leaning in when you pray. How cool is that? So in the morning, when you pray, wanting to do right by God, wanting to acknowledge to God in heaven, read his word, and you're praying in the morning, anybody else in Christ who just believes in Jesus and doesn't want to live righteously, he, he, their prayers, God just like, but when you pray as a righteous person, he leans in to hear. How, how, how awesome is that? That we take that for granted. I, I think I, I do. But I'm like, wow. You know, he's mentioning that here in James 5, 16. Because we bastardize it and go, oh, it means that whatever I ask. Well, you're assuming that you're righteous. You know, let's look at what righteous means, you know, to, to do what is right, to do to obey God and his word. And to obey God and his word means the more you know about his word, the better opportunity you have to do what's right by his word. But John 14, 21 makes it clear, he who has his commandments and keeps them is he that loves him. And the faith is a representation of living out the love of Christ. So you can't live out the love of Christ unless you obey him. And you can't obey him unless you know what the rules are or how to obey him. And the more you know how to obey him, the better you can be at obeying him. Which goes back to the word of God. It goes back to the written and living word of God relationship in our life. And if we cultivate the written and living word of God relationship in our life, the written to lead us to the ultimate living word in our life relationship. And if we cultivate that, then as we're doing that, and then you pray, oh, all day long, God's going to lean in and go, oh, please speak to me, daughter, son. Oh, let, me, let me hear what you have to say. All day long. He loves that. But if a person who doesn't want to do that, they want to act like, oh, you know, I live Jesus and you people say, Rrr. and you want to live your little doofus life and do doofus things. And go, oh, God, please, God, help me today on this situation. He's going, oh, this guy again. This shopper. Really? Really? Yeah, he hears you, but really? You act like he should hear you the same as he hears the other person. Why, why would he do that? He tells you he's not going to do that. Why, why would he write this in the book if there's not a if there's not a difference maker and how you live your life changes how he hears you? I didn't write it. 
But in, Matt, in James 5, 15 to 16, he makes it very clear that there's a certain level of response or of power given to the people who live a certain way when they speak to God. I'm just, I didn't write it. Didn't write it. But he says in verse 17 of James 5, Elijah was a man of, of like infirmity with us, meaning he's just like us. He's just like our same frailties. And he prayed a prayer, and it might not rain. It did not rain on the land for those three years and six months. And again, he prayed, heaven gave rain, and the earth put forth her fruit. And it's from my other friends would go, you see, all you're doing is proving poor, man, that God, that, 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 that God can do what he wants. Uh, but he lets you, he, he'll do whatever Elijah's saying. So they make it sound like Elijah's on his own just made it rain and not rain. That's not true at all, by the way. All God's saying is, is that uh, his prayer meant something, and I'm honoring him by doing what I've already ordained before time to have done. He did not change anything. Just to make sure about this, let's go to remind you of that. I think it's important to remind you of this. And, and a couple, three verses in the Old Testament to remind you that prayer does not change things. All Elijah was doing was fulfilling what God already had orchestrated before time. It looks like Elijah did it, but he didn't. He just was the righteous man doing that, and God was showing him us. He didn't use an unrighteous man to do it. He used a righteous man to do it, and that's why he did that, just to show the, the alignment with his will and a righteous person. Boom, prayer is answered. Isaiah 40, 44. Isaiah, there's two verses. Isaiah 44, 7. Who is like me? Verse 7. Who is like me? Let him stand up and call and announce and make ready for me. This is the Septuagint. And as much as I have made a man for this age, let them tell you the train of events before they come to pass. As in other words, who knows what's going to happen before it happens? God's like, he says it in the Hebrew text. of saying, I do. Of course he does. He's God. He knows all things. Isaiah 45, verse 5. Another verse. Because, because I am the Lord God, and there is no God besides me. I strengthen thee, and when thou didst know it, without this, thou did not know me, that death from the rising of the sun and from thy things going down, you may know there is no other God but me. He is the God who knows all things. There's no other God but him. And then you go over to, which I like to read it from the King James, one of my famous, one, which is one of my, in the Old Testament, one of my life verses. I, I love it. And Daniel 4.35, after Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, I'm a God. And, and God goes, no, no, you're not. And he made him like an animal for seven years. All fours, couldn't talk, eat like an animal, like a beast. Then all of a sudden he gets restored. And he gets restored, oh, I can talk again, I can walk again. Yeah, okay. After all that happens, then God says this in Daniel 4.35. After that huge big deal occurrence, God says this in Daniel 4.35 on the heels of just humbling the greatest man in the world, the king of Babylon, the king of the whole planet at the time, of the known world, I should say. And he says this after he got humbled like a, like a little peanut ant. He says, okay, in verse 35 of Daniel 4, and the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand or say to him, what doest thou? But you're going to tell me that that God New Testament all of a sudden goes, I'm not going to do anything unless you tell me to, and then I'll just do whatever you tell me to do. Where do you, where do you get this from? So where, do you, where do you get this from? That's not what prayer is. God makes it clear. He does what he wants to do. He tells you, Isaiah, I'm the God who dictates all things. I know what's going to happen before it happens. He, I know what the... I know it's going to happen because I've already heard Dan's going to happen. I've already told you that I'm the guy. I'm the one. There's no other person but me. God tells you that. Yeah, it's interesting. He did this to the head of gold of the image of the times of the uh -oh. Gentiles. So it's like he's saying, well, now you know what's going to happen to the rest of this image. Oh, yeah. And, and, and another thing, too, with Elijah, it's almost like he got a double portion. The rain, he stayed for three and a half years in the Old Testament. It happens again in the tribulation time. It's yeah. like he gets his double portion. Yeah, Elijah gets like a double portion because he had the same, yeah, the same issue of miracles of the rain and the time of his rain also. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty nice God doing that. Yeah. But then you go get look at prayer also in um in, in First Peter in chapter three, since we're right there. In First Peter three, people say things like, you know, again, where are you getting this from that God isn't hearing my prayer as he hears anybody else's prayer? If I'm in Christ, I believe in Jesus, I can pray, you're full of hogwash, man. You're lying, you're lying, man. Because God hears me like as anybody else. He doesn't hear people differently. Okay, watch this. So once you go to First Peter, by the way, who's Peter written to? Uh, believers. 
and the verse, the first uh, verse, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the sojourners of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge. He's talking to called out ones. He's talking to people that are mature ones in Christ. Okay, let's get that clear. First Peter chapter one, verse one and two. The audience is not Gentiles. It's not boneheads. It's people in Christ maturing in their faith, but still have issues with sin. In First Peter chapter three. Because they're sin, we're all sinners. <laughs> verse Peter chapter 3, verse 7, after he talks about the woman behaving properly in a marriage, then he turns to the husband. In like manner, husbands, dwell according to knowledge with the female as the weaker vessel, bestowing honor as being also joint heirs of the gracious gift of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered. It means blocked. You've had your calls blocked or text blocked on your cell phone? God does that to people who don't do what he says. Is that Old Testament? I mean, no, that's new. I'm sorry, that's First Peter. That's New Testament. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Well, I didn't write it, did I? I didn't write that. Pretty clear to me. The God of the Old Testament ain't no different than the God of the New Testament. He's saying to me, he's saying to me, he's saying to you, if you play around and think it's funny, and you can just believe in me and live like you could just be unrighteous and be a sinner, engage yourself in rebellious acts and hypocrisy. And you want to go and call to me and pray to me? I mean, you've been blocked. Why do you think it's funny? You think it's funny? Oh, oh, I, oh, I get it. You block loved ones on your cell phone. You block them from texting you. You think it's funny. Okay. He takes, he blocks you. And you're like, what? God would never do that. He just said it. The word hindered means blocked. Just shut up. I mean, hello? That ain't funny. So I don't care who you think you are. Uh, it's very clear to me. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the audience, and this is what part of people in seminaries want to do in church chanting. Well, he's talking to people that are not believers in Jesus, and if they don't believe in Jesus, their prayers are hindered. That's not what he said. Stop making it up. The audience is clear. The book is written to people in Christ, chosen. Chosen, come out ones. Hello, come on, man. Don't change it because it gets taught language against what you believe. Who cares if you believe? What, what does God say? God tells you clearly in First Peter three seven. This is a big deal, basically. Then, of course, as we can also go over to uh, John, go to the book of First John. People mistake this all the time. I love people say to me. Um, well, you know, this is how this is how it's supposed to be, um, because they they'll, they'll not understand what Jesus said, and, and they'll just misappropriate things. They'll ignore First John five fourteen. You can hold your spot there, by the way, for context. We want to go back to John fourteen. So go to John fourteen. Go to John fourteen first, and you will see in verse thirteen this 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 idea that people get mistaken how they act like, you know, they misunderstand what prayer is. Again, prayer does not change things. Prayer changes you, me. Changes human beings, not things. We're not things, we're people. So, in verse 13 of John 14, where you read here first, and whatever you may ask in my name. And by the way, the difference between ask and desus is different. There was the word in first. Remember in James five sixteen, it was the, the the righteous man's Jesus prayer. That's his that's his need. The word ask is different. It's artimon. It's, it's different. It means a request. You can the request is different from a need. I need to have the blood stop flowing out of my leg. God, please help this blood to clot. Give me a tourniquet. That's a need. Father, I ask that you would please give me a filet mignon cooked perfectly. It tastes awesome. That's not a need. That's a want. <laughs> I like it, but it's not a, not a need. There's many forms of protein. I'm just asking for a specific, right? Come on. There's a difference between a need and a request. You know? Father, I, I, I need my neighbor to stop not being nice to me. It's not a need. That's a request. What I need to do, Father, is forgive my neighbor. That's a need. <laughs> you need to forgive them. But you don't need to have them be nice to you. That's not a need. That's a request. 
You see, there's a difference between a need and a desis is different in James 5.16 versus here in John 14.13. The word is different. Not desis as in requests. It's different. The desis means a need, a prayer of need. And here it's a prayer of request. Not the same thing. So Jesus says, whatever you may request, better way to say it, in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, in John 14, 14, anything in my name, this I will do. And many people take this verse in prosperity gospel. You see, Jesus said, we can say anything in his name. And I say to you, that I'm a millionaire, and I have money in my wallet. Look at that there. Okay, they're so dumb. It's dumb. But they teach that kind of malarkey garbage in the word of faith movement. They can speak things into existence because of this, these verses. That it, yeah. Uh, Pam said, God's word is our guidebook for life. Is any of it written to unbelievers? Nope. 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 In, in Hebrews, he talks about the, the book written, written to us and for us. And so, yeah, no. The book is not written for anybody who doesn't believe. It's either, it's either for people of covenant or in testament. That's it. That's the best way to say it. The whole entire Bible is written for folks of covenant or in testament, and that's it. Can you be outside of covenant and testament and benefit from it? Sure. Sure you can. But it's not for you. It's not written anything about you. You're mentioned in there as as a reference of, of people that lived and breathed and died and will have their up and comings. But there's nothing in there for you. Nothing in there to you. It's just there's things about you in it. Yeah. Those things that are there are things written to and for people of covenant and testament. There's things about every person who's ever lived. If there wasn't, then you wouldn't God would not be able to tell us how he's going to judge the quick and the dead, right? And the Joseph had and the Bean Seed and the Great White Throne and the Lake of Fire and the Sea of Glass. Those are all places of judgment because it's written to and for the covenant people and testament people, but it's also about everybody else who is not in that category. So yeah, that's why tribulation incurs those people, right? They're definitely in view. But it's not written to and for them, but it's about them, right? So there's it, there's about there's things about people of all kinds in the Bible. But to your point, nothing to and for them is in there. You can't talk about you can't say to a person who's not in testament and not of covenant, here take this verse, it means something to you. And no, no it doesn't. It's not written for them. You can't, give, you can't give a prescription for, for someone else's medical condition to someone else just because you think it might work. It doesn't work that way. That That's for that person. You know, that's why it's illegal to do that, by the way, right? It's supposed to be illegal to share prescription medications because of that reason. Because everything's specific to that person's need and their biology of how they interact with that particular drug, right? That need. So, anyway. And she said right. Okay. So you're right. So no, I get your. So you're, so when you say you pray, they say they pray in verse 13. Uh, they they ask they ask they, they act like whatever I request from God I can get. And so they read verse 13 and 14 of, of John 14 and go, okay, I'm gonna I'm just gonna stop there and camp out. Because you just say you ask anything in my name, this I will do. But go over to First John 5:14. The same author God say, told the same writer in John to write this, just to I believe to expound on the boneheads. We didn't understand what he was talking about. But the audience he was talking to is who? The apostles. The apostles. The apostles. Who is in view in John 14? The apostles. The apostles. The apostles. You didn't hear me say it. By the way, not all 12. Judas is gone. He's gone. It's just the 11. And again, if prayer was, was for anybody to ask anything they wanted, and just say, put a little Jesus on it. If that was the point of it, then why did he not teach that? At Matthew 5's Beatitudes sermons, the, the be this and be that, right? Blessed is the man that that, that is and the, the peacemaker. Blessed the council. And, sorry, blessed, blessed, blessed is the man who's the, who's the peacemaker. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, right? Why all those blessed bees? Was the, 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 the guy named was Warren's bee. He writes the bee books, the Beatitudes, and all this. So all those Beatitudes God gave, Jesus gave. There were ones he talked about praying anything in His name, and then you want, I'll do. He didn't say that. Why, why wait till now? Again, these are things that people just need to ask the question. Why did Jesus, Yeshua, who is the living word of God, live his entire three-year ministry, not mention anything at all about praying in his name, anything you want him to do for you? But he says it now in John 14, 
after the Last Supper, Judas being gone, 11 people are the only ones who can hear him say this. Why wait till now to say that? And why are you ignoring that important fact? Why is that always ignored? In the same chapter about, I built a prayer place for you, where I may be also, there's many mansions, okay? He's not talking to everybody. If he was, why was not everybody in view when he said it? I, I, these are questions that they just ignore in seminary. They ignore from the pulpit. And if you say it doesn't make, make a difference, then why did he wait till Judas was gone to say it? There's already a close group of 12. He waited till the, the Yahoo was gone, then the 11 were there, and he said it. I mean, are you serious? You don't think that's anywhere near important to understand? That just doesn't matter. Okay. But in John 14, just to make clear for folks who don't want to hear the truth, word of faith people, prosperity, gospel people, ignorant folk, he says, okay, John, write this, please, in John 5, 14. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence which we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, the lima, he hears us. In verse 15, and we know, we see it. That he hears us. Whatever we ask, whatever we petition him for, request, we have the petitions for, which we have asked from him. So you see, he's talking about us. Us who needed to understand what he's talking to. He didn't mention according to his will because that was already understood by the 11 who were hearing him. How could they not know that? After walking with him for three years as the tight-knit group that they were to Jesus. After seeing Judas leave. And even he recognized that he was wrong. Not going to God's will. In Matthew 27 when he cast back the silver. Even he knew he went against God's will. Because he knew after the fact that, oh my gosh, that's right. We're supposed to submit to God's will. We've been taught that. I was taught that by Yeshua all these years. I was trying to twist his arm and proclaim kingship and throw down the Romans. And this whole tyranny. I get it, Judas, but you were wrong. Right idea, wrong way to go about it. And that's the whole thing with, with John 14. He's writing down scriptures, John is, that Jesus spoke of, that is in a crowd of only 11 people hearing, and yet everybody in church, and he makes it sound like it's to everybody. And it's not to everybody. And they keep on bastardizing it, bastardizing it. And it's, it's so sickening. Like, just stop it already, you know? Just acknowledge for what it is. It's written to a group of people that are unique and distinct in that situation only. And they are given these comments about you ask anything in, 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 my, in my name, I'll give it to you by what it is. Then in 1 John 5, 14 to 15, he clarified by saying, according to his thelema will, his will in time. You see? So I can't say, for example, like my word of faith people say, well, you can ask God to simply, uh, you know, anything you want, he'll give it to you. So I can ask to have wings and fly. That's going to happen? No. It's not going to happen. You can't do that. It's not going to happen, right? So, going back also, lastly, um, to look at, to go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians, in Paul's uh, famous statement, the one short versing in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17. But the context of this is interesting because it's verses 15 to 18, or 15 down, and I should say 15 to 19. It's actually interesting. He says, see that no one renders evil for evil. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 15. See, no one renders, or don't repay vengeance, evil for evil, don't do that, cock off or cock off, which means in terms of position of just hatred and malice and bitterness, don't do that. You just say, I almost think that a lot of litigation is rendering evil for evil. Oh, it is, a lot of litigation is, yeah, it is, a lot of that. Just, they, they got harmed, they want to hurt you just as bad. They, they say it too, they even say, I want to get back to you just as much, that's my vengeance, I'll have my vengeance, don't you? But, see, that's not Christian. Supposed to forgive and be no, no, render good for evil. There he says, anyone but always pursue the good. And pursuing the good, if you look on left side of your margin, that's the agathos. In other words, have your inner disposition be changed. He's acknowledging that in our inner nature, it's easy in our inner nature to have evil and bitterness and wickedness creep in when someone has crossed you, wronged you, hurt you, scarred you. It's pretty normal to have that happen to you. But in the context of this pray without ceasing, he starts with this issue, I think, is a different mindset here. He's talking about see that no one render this. Don't look at vengeance. Change disposition, both toward each other and toward all. Verse 16, rejoice always. Then in verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray unceasingly. 
That means without any gas. So he speaks to that psalmist we talked about last week, or two weeks ago, when the psalmist said, I pray in the evening, in the morning, in the afternoon. So he says, pray without ceasing. He's, why is he saying that? So understand the context of saying pray without ceasing. If the context is so that we will have our inner disposition be changed. So if you say you pray without ceasing, but you're still harboring bitterness and hatred and malice and indifference, then you're not praying without ceasing correctly. I'm sorry, but you're not. You can't continue to say you're praying unceasingly and that's still your disposition of your heart. Because that's the difference in what he's talking about in 1 Thessalonians 15, 17 for context. People like to use verse 17 and just throw it out there in the ether like there's no context to it. There's a context to it, my friends. I didn't write it, right? In verse 18 and 19, he even sums it up by saying, everything give thanks, for this is God's will by Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, which is of Christ. In other words, everything's God's will, meaning the things that happen good in your life or bad in your life. Either way, it's God's will for you. And so because it's God's will for our life, we're supposed to, again, not render evil for evil. That Because God's, what he's saying to you, Paul's saying, I think I can speak from experience. I had some bad things happen to me. I did some bad things unto people. But in all things, God has been lovingly, graciously kind to me. I can, I can personally testify I was treated maliciously, unwarranted. But I also treated folks maliciously, unwarranted if I was honest about my sinful life before I knew Jesus. So who am I to render evil for evil? He sees himself for who he is. And he wants people in Thessalonica to do the same as he wants us to do the same. Look at the inner disposition of Agatha's good. That's what you should be doing toward all people, toward each other and toward all. And he goes on to talk about rejoicing, praying without ceasing, because knowing that God's will uh, is being done. If you keep on harboring or keep on uh, focusing in on the pain and anguish or the evil someone did unto you, then all you're doing is negating what he's talking about. Because he's saying, praying without ceasing means the proof of that is there's an inner peace of a disposition that's changing inside of you. That's the evidence. So if you have an inner peace inside of you that, that, that is calming, and by the way, one of the evidences for me, I'm going to call myself out. If you ever want to test me on this, you can call me out on this, by the way. I'm going to put myself out there. Uh, they say it's a tell. You know, someone says, oh, you, your eyes move to the right when you lie, or you, you tend, to, tend to look down when you're embarrassed. Or Some people have certain tells that represent how they're feeling or thinking, right? Well, my tell just so you know, I'm telling you the truth, if I, Brother Todd knows it, if somebody, if, if I, if I get, uh, uh, say, um, nervous or or intimidated or just don't feel comfortable when someone's in front of me, I talk fast, right? Everybody knows that, I think, if you picked up on that. But that's, that's a known thing for the most part. But another tell for me is, if I'm not dealing with stress properly, if I'm not dealing with, with unknowns and, and, and wrongs being done to me and just a tumult of snowball of things happening unto me, I'll bite my fingernails off. Like they'll be gone. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, but now I got them. So if you ever wanna, it's a tell for me. If you ever wanna look at my fingernails and you see they're all gone, I'm not handling the stress too well. I'm just, <laughs> that's the honest truth of it. It just is, I know myself. So I can lie to, my, I can lie to myself and say, no, that's just that thing. No, that's what that is. And by the way, when I say stress, let me be more specific. What I mean by that is, I don't have that peace in my heart that I should have, because I don't have that prayer in my life that I should have to calm me. I need to have some things that calm me. I need to, I need to focus more on, and the only thing I can do that is the Lord. I need to focus more on the Lord's will in my life and the benefits of what I have and from what he's done. And when I had that constant communion with remembrance and, and gratitude and ruminating, meditating over this, that's what reminds me of things and not stress me out. So when Paul says pray without ceasing, I don't have any breaks in the, in the chain. And that's why it's interesting we call things prayer chains, right? They say I have a prayer chain. What they mean by that is kind of in line with what Paul's saying. Pray and cease, meaning don't break the chain. Continue to have it passed on so each person has a certain point in time of the day that they pray. Now, that that's fine. But the reality, I'm not saying I'm pro or anti-prayer chain. I'm just, I've been a part of them in the past, but when certain things have come up. But it's just one of those things where it's an interesting thought that it's a chain which speaks which speaks to links, that there's no broken link or else it wouldn't be a chain, which is what praying without ceasing means. You have no break in your, in your mentality. So whether you're doing things informally, 
or formally, you're constantly talking with God. But here's the problem with that is that sometimes when you're doing sometimes when you're doing that, there's two things that I find wrong with it. One is you get the illusion that that's enough to then replace the formal petitioning of God in your in your posturing at that set time in the morning. That's not enough to do no. You should still be doing that set time in the morning, no doubt about it. You, you should. It's a fact, and the Psalms tells you that you're supposed to do that set time as a person of God. Again, Psalm 42, 8, Psalm 141, 1 and 2 talks about also being a treasured sacrifice to God. So that should be both. It should be a set aside time in the morning of a treasured sacrifice, but then you also have to do that. That's the danger that I have faulted myself on. I have gone the pendulum swing on one or the other. And then secondly, I think the danger is, is that when you pray without ceasing, focus in on that, you tend to either swap out one for the other, which is wrong, and they're supposed to be both being done, or you tend to, um, uh, you tend to, how do you want to say this the right way? Um, we tend to um, minimize